Shani, and to all the uh, AES Design and Evaluation Learning Sprint team for setting this up. It is uh, a great honor to have so many people tuning in um, to hear about how we might evaluate co-design capabilities and conditions. So I am located on the unceded territory of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and would like to pay my respects to the elders and ancestors who have cared for this country uh, for thousands and thousands of years. I'd also like to acknowledge um, the iwi of Te Tai Tokoro in Tamaki Makoto in Aotearoa, New Zealand, from where I hail. I'm um, really fortunate to, to be from a very beautiful part of the world um, and also to be heading back to Aotearoa tomorrow for a couple of months. Um, so if I seemed a bit excited, uh, it, that, that might also be one of the reasons why. As Shani said, my name is Emma Blomkamp. My pronouns are she, her. I work mainly independently, supporting people to build their capability in co-design. I deliver training, coaching, and mentoring programs. I'm an honorary fellow at the University of Melbourne. Um, and this year, I founded a community of practice called Co-Design Co. So you can find me uh, online in a few places. I am still on Twitter. Um, with, I think there's a few people still left there um, and definitely invite you to, to talk and share um, there. So today I will give a bit more of an introduction to myself shortly to give you a bit of context for where some of the ideas that I will be sharing have come from. I'm also really keen to hear who's here. Um, and so we'll give you a chance to um, share a few details about yourself via the poll function um, in Zoom so that I can understand who I'm speaking with a bit. Um, and that will help me decide what and how to share some things I've learned about evaluating design capability. Um, I've been developing a maturity model recently that it aims to assess the capabilities and conditions for co-design at a range of levels and you're going to get a um, sneak peek at it. I've shared it a couple of times with people this year but it's not um, publicly available yet as I'm still finessing it. So today's a really great chance for you to test it out um, and even offer some feedback on it as well. So you'll get the chance to do your own assessment of your co-design capabilities um, and then you are um, welcome to share some thoughts um, and I'll, I'll let you know later when we get to that how you can do it. So first of all, a little bit about my journey into design and evaluation. I uh, thought I was a pretty rare butterfly at one point combining these interests, but just look at um, the turnout today and all of the events that are happening um, with the special interest group and can see that there's a lot of folks who see connections uh, between design and evaluation. So I'm going to kind of skip skip the first 30 years of my life um, and just start um, with when I was doing a PhD on community well-being and local cultural policy. And in that um, research, I really focused on local government's role in promoting community well-being, understood in quite a holistic way as social, environmental and economic and cultural well-being. And I was particularly interested in cultural well-being, the slippery concept of what the arts and culture programs in local government are supposed to contribute to and how on earth you might know if a local government is making a difference in relation to cultural well-being. I never set out to explore evaluation explicitly, but naturally with that um, research interest, evaluation became one of the things I dove deep into. I um, found in particular two types of evaluative practices going on in these contexts. Uh, evaluation for legitimation, which was especially about accountability and advocacy, and evaluation for learning, which would be more about informing decisions and improvements. So obviously there's overlap between these two types, but I found it interesting um, that there were quite different reasons and methods sometimes, depending what kind of um, rationale you had for evaluation. But I also found that in their everyday practice, local cultural policy workers relied on much less formal mo modes of knowledge. They really prioritized interpersonal feedback and local knowledge. And there was a tension between the reliance on objective numbers and bureaucratic language and the process and outcomes of cultural policy and how to communicate them in meaningful ways. 
So I um, wasn't into design at this point. I was much more interested in evaluation, but um, shortly found myself working in a small social innovation agency in Auckland, New Zealand, where I learned on the job about co-design and co-design for social innovation in particular. Um, and so I was really fortunate to learn from um, some excellent mentors and alongside some wonderful colleagues and with some great communities um, in Auckland. I came back to Australia um, in 2016, so my PhD was jointly between um, Melbourne and Auckland universities, and then I came back to take a role with the Policy Lab, which at the time was a really new research unit at the University of Melbourne, and I was able to bring together my research interests and practical applied um, work to geek out about co-design for public policy, um, try and explore what this emerging practice was, and in particular look um, at how people were trying to build design capability in the public sector. So what I'll be sharing today in particular draws on a couple of research case studies I did um, at the time. One was looking at what a um, governmental organization was doing in using a design-led approach to policy development for the very first time. And another was um, an evaluation that I led of a capability building program for um, people in an Australian government department who are learning co-design. So I'll be sharing some insights um, soon, and those are some key sources. After um, my role with the University of Melbourne, I, I, found I, I found myself in a role with Paper Giant, a strategic design consultancy in Melbourne, where I was the co-design and evaluation lead. And once again, at the time I was like, thought this was pretty new to be bringing these two practices together. Um, but as we can see there, there's lots of people now who see the connections between them, especially with you know, evaluation practices like developmental evaluation and principles-based evaluation. So the, an example, I would often be working quite separately. There'd be projects where I was leading co-design or projects where I was leading evaluation, but there was one amazing project where they all came together, um, the Supporting Justice Project. There's heaps of info online about that, so you can look look into that if you're interested, um, where, where we led co-design for systems change and had a really strong evaluation component throughout it. So that's also been a key project in informing my um, knowledge of these practices. As I mentioned before, these days I mainly work independently. Um, I have a few training programs and this year launched this community of practice, Co-Design Co, and want to acknowledge that um, I ran a jam session with Co-Design Co members uh, a month or two ago and got some really useful feedback on the maturity model I'll be presenting. I would also like to acknowledge that I am standing on the shoulders of many um, peers and mentors and organizations who've done great work in this space. So um, the maturity model I've developed is not entirely my own ideas, but it's bringing together um, work from lots of different people who've done fantastic um, work in the space um, and building on my mix of research evaluation and applied, ex you know, experience working in the space to bring it all together. So that's a little bit about me and what's brought me to this point today to be talking to you about evaluating capabilities and conditions for co-design. I am super keen to know a little bit about who I'm talking to, um, and I totally appreciate in a session like this that you might have your video off, but it would be really nice if I'm not um, just speaking to, to blankness and get to know a little bit about you. So I've got a couple of poll questions that I am launching. In case you're on some kind of device where the polls don't show up, um, please just write, write your responses in the chat. So the first question is about your location. Where are you based? I want to test my assumption here that we're mainly Australians who've signed up to the Austral Australasian Evaluation Society event. Um, I suspect there might be a few people from New Zealand, and I'm curious whether there's, if there's anyone else, because I might need to explain my cultural context a little bit more as I go, if so. So I can see 90% of people have participated in this poll. That's probably everyone who can see it. And I can confirm that my assumption was indeed correct. We are 98% uh, Australians or people based in Australia. Um, and one person has identified as they're from Aotearoa. Kia ora. 
Um, sorry, I thought I was sharing the results, but there they are. You can see them now. So that's my first question. Um, my second question is, let me see how to get to the next poll. Is who, who are you? What kind of role um, would you describe that you have? Are you a designer? Are you an evaluator? Do you describe yourself as both? Um, or are you neither of these things? If you're neither of these things, would you mind writing your role or what kind of work you do in the chat just so I can understand how to relate um, what I'm sharing to you um, and see how much pre-existing knowledge I might presume. Ha, Jethro, I know. Don't you hate it when someone asks you to put yourself in a box? Um, of course, um, you're welcome to interpret this as broadly as you like. Um, what do I mean by designer? Well, I am asking if you see yourself as a designer. So that's absolutely how you would interpret it. There are many kinds of design out there and we will be talking about some shortly. Um, and you'll see that I understand design in quite a broad way. Um, so obviously there's some people who aren't necessarily that, but are a project coordinator in health research or a PhD researcher, uh, people who do policy and research, health planning. Yeah. So people, a couple of the comments saying people, you know, do support evaluation practice, uh, but are not necessarily an evaluator. But definitely people, I think what I'm hearing is people who do or support research and evaluation, if you're not. Um, so what we can see is probably not surprisingly, again, given who's organized this event, we are predominantly evaluators, but 22% of you identify as both a designer and evaluator. I am not alone. I have to say, I've never actually identified as an evaluator either. Um, I've done a bit of evaluation work over the years, um, but I am with, with those of you who struggle to put yourself in that box. Okay, final question is, however you would describe your current professional discipline, you don't have to put it into that, um, one of those narrow categories I just shared. But how did you learn um, your current profession or discipline? So there's a few options this time. Um, curious when we're talking about capability building, um, if we actually have a bit of a self-reflection to think about in the job you're in right now, how did you learn how to do it? I'll just give you a chance to respond to that. Or once again, if you can't see the poll, you're welcome to write in the chat. All right, we've got 84% participation so far. I'll wait until we've got 90 at least, and then um, we'll end that poll in just a sec. Okay, I think that's uh, stopping. So mostly probably a mix of these things, which is not surprising, but 41% have primarily learned on the job and only 13% primarily at university or tertiary education. Um, so mainly a mix of the above, but interesting to see, a, uh, you know, some of the differences. And I think that's going to be relevant when we are thinking about building capability. So I'd like to talk about a few things that I've learned over the years around evaluating design capability. The first is the importance in discerning between different levels of capability, design and change. I've borrowed this diagram from, from Nesta's fantastic playbook of innovation learning that um, I highly recommend if you're interested in, in this kind of thing. Um, but, you know, the key idea here is that what, you know, an individual might have a range of capabilities, attitudes, aptitudes. You might be an awesome designer, but are you working in a team, organization and system that enables you to apply those things? And that's definitely one of the things I've seen is a particular frustration for people who are interested in co-design and working in conditions such as siloed, hierarchical organizations. Some of you may, you know, have an idea of what I'm talking about here that don't necessarily support collaboration and creativity. So I think when we're talking about capability and conditions, it's really important to, to be clear on what level um, we're talking about. 
what do I mean when I talk about design? I mean all of these things. So another way to think about different levels is the different orders of design. This idea is originally from Richard Buchanan. And if you are familiar with systems or systemic design, this won't be new to you. But recognizing that um, not everyone here is a designer, I will explain this one. Um, so, you know, Buchanan pointed out, and this, this idea has been much used since then, um, that design orders can be described going from kind of the concrete and specific order of graphic design, where you are working with signs, symbols, print, communication. And I think often when people think about a designer, this is the kind of designer that comes to mind. Or maybe they're thinking about a person who designs furniture or um, products, and that's industrial design, the second order of design. Design has been increasingly moving into other spaces over the last couple of decades, and there are more and more experienced designers in particular, especially as digital services um, proliferate. And so we see more and more people working in service design, experience de design, interaction design, the third order of design, getting up to the more abstract and complex level of systems de design. We're talking here about designing businesses or redesigning systems of um, education or government, for instance. So many different kinds of design and depending which level or order you're working at will determine the kinds of methods or approach you should take and what kinds of impact you, you're you expecting to see. So I think, it, you know, if we're talking about design capability, it's also important to think about what kind of design, what kind of design capability are we talking about? And to be clear, especially um, for those of us who work in and with the public sector, that what works in corporate environments might not always translate well into, into the public sector. Um, and to be cognizant of the difference between, for instance, policy design and service design. And in particular, thinking about in a country like Australia, things like democratic politics and bureaucratic structures and how design works within them um, when we're talking about public service design or public pol policy design. Another way I think that I find useful to um, differentiate between design approaches is borrowing Elizabeth Sanders' idea about the difference between an expert mindset and a participatory mindset and recognizing that um, co-design, which I'm particularly interested and experienced in, sits within this family in a very particular location. Um, in really simple terms, we're talking about designing with people rather than designing to or for them. Um, Community-led design is often something that those interested in co-design aspire for, where people we're actually de designing by people. Uh, however, if you work with a, a public or community or not-for-profit kind of organization, it's quite rare to um, hand over resources and authority entirely to communities and let them fully lead. Um, so that, though, would be the kind of, you know, really, really embracing that participatory mindset and actually um, allowing people most affected by the decision to be making the decisions, not to have professionals making them on their behalf. It is super tough though. We are generally working in sectors that value professional standards and specialist expertise. I'm, you know, a, a former and occasional academic myself. So I'm definitely familiar with the challenge of moving from an expert to a participatory mindset. It's not easy, but if we actually wanna do co-design, we have to be making that shift in practice um, as hard as it is to achieve and maintain. In the public policy context, again, we're talking specifically about a huge shift in policymaking practice from policymakers as experts and analysts to people who need to facilitate um, and convene and connect with citizens. Um, and there's a quote there from the co-design capability program that I evaluated in 2017 from a policymaker who said, after going through this co-design program, you can read the research and know the facts but it's different when you're actually faced with someone and they're really open about the problem and tell you lots about their life. Um, this requires quite a different role um, for people to play. The challenge is for those of us who want to support um, design capability is that mindsets are really hard to teach. 
they're pretty deeply um, held ways of seeing and being in the world. And it's a lot easier to teach a toolkit. Co-design, um, though, is a lot more than a toolkit. As this um, article says, co-design should be regarded first as a philosophy and only second a method. So a lot of the proponents of co-design are really emphasizing the, the mindsets and the principles. I myself um, think those are, are really valuable. Um, but if you're introducing people to a new, a new method and way of working, it's a lot easier to provide people with like tools that are just kind of ready to go and easy to pick up. Um, but don't quite give people necessarily the nuance and skills to adapt for the context in which we're, they're working. One of the things that I've realized recently, especially as I'm focusing more and more on supporting others to learn about and apply co-design methods, is that people who are new need rule-based learning. So some of us more experienced designers may get a little bit cynical and critical about models like the double diamond or human-centered design toolkits. But the, the thing is, is when people are new to, to something, they need, actually, they need simpler, easier to follow steps and sequences. Um, so there's a balance between um, kind of showing people all the complexity and nuances and expecting people to be able to choose the best method and giving people somewhere to start. So one of the things, again, this is a, a diagram from Nesta's playbook for innovation learning that I've been drawing on for my maturity model is really trying to be able to help people differentiate between where they are at in their journey and to be able to choose the right kinds of um, learning and support that they need to, to get where they want to go. And so finally, um, the final key learning I want to share is that design is a craft and it requires learning by doing. I realized that myself when I was learning on the job, I'd gone from, you know, a very academic context doing my PhD um, to suddenly needing to learn how to do things in a different way. And it was a really effective way to learn by trying things out, by observing what others were doing, by reflecting on my practice and this experiential learning cycle um, that Kolb developed it is a really good way of thinking about how adults learn, especially for a craft or a practice like design. So these are kind of the, some of the key things that I, I've learned about how, when we're evaluating or, um, how design capability is being built, particularly in the public and social sectors, are important to keep in mind that there are different levels of capability, design and change that if we're talking about more participatory approaches like co-design, we need to be realistic about how challenging it is to shift from an expert to a participatory mindset. That toolkits are easier to teach than mindsets and actually can be useful at the beginning um, before people have enough experience to be able to decide themselves how to pick and adapt tools for, for the work that they're doing. Um, and that we're talking about a craft, which requires learning by doing. So I am going to keep going so that I can um, make sure you get a chance to test this out. I understand that Mallory's um, going to be collecting questions in the chat, and hopefully we'll have at least a few minutes at the end for questions. So if you've got any questions, do feel free to put them in the chat. But what I would like to do is talk about this maturity model and give you a chance to test it out, um, to see to see where how I'm putting these ideas into practice. So the reason um, that I have developed this model is to try and help people identify their strengths and needs in co-design. It's the kind of thing, especially if you are newer to it or you're you know, somewhat experienced, it can be kind of hard to know where to go and how to develop your skills or knowledge more or where you might want to focus on. So it's something that individuals can use in that way, but also a way to help people assess their readiness for co-design. Um, co-design is not always the right approach and the conditions do not always support it. But how do you know? Um, so I'm hoping this talk can kind of help, especially thinking about the organizational context that people are working within. And, you know, quite simply, it's a maturity model. So the idea is to try and understand your maturity, to see it as at this point in time, where, I, where are you at? Um, and it might be applied at the level of an individual, a team, or an organization. So you'll get the chance to, to apply it at one of those levels today.
One thing to say too is that the maturity model is based on a framework I developed a couple of years back to articulate what co-design practice looks like at that fourth order of systemic design. So thinking about um, something that we could call co-design and complex systems or systemic design. Um, and it built on my earlier work trying to understand and articulate what co-design is in the context of public policy, where I really honed in on it being a practice, a process, um, and a set of principles. But in this model, I also bring in place and people because I think they're often forgotten in other frameworks um, about doing this work. So we'll talk through these domains in a moment because they're the same domains that appear in the maturity model. If you are interested um, in learning more about this, the systemic design practice framework that's kind of the predecessor to the maturity model is up on my website and I'll just chuck the link in the chat there um, so you can go and read deeply about it later if you're interested. It's, this is also where I will end up putting the uh, maturity model early next year, um, hopefully. So this is the high level view of what it, what it looks like at this point. So we've got five different levels that we can kind of use to describe someone or an organization's um, maturity and co-design starting out at explore um, at the bottom where people are just starting to get curious about co-design. It's something they've heard of, but they don't yet maybe understand exactly what's evolved um, and how it can deliver value. I think what's important for me too is um, articulating the difference between understanding something and actually being able to apply it. So we might understand the concepts of that of something. And I think there's a lot of people out there who get what co-design is, this idea of designing with, um, and, and actually see the appeal, but that doesn't mean you can do it. <laughs> so actually talking about applying the principles and practices in context is the next level. Getting up to a more sophisticated level where you're integrating co-design, and that's where you're going further than just picking up a pre-existing tool, but you're actually able to adapt and embed principles and practices at your work. And at the top there, there would be very, very few individuals and organizations that are at that level of flourish where you're actually evolving and spreading co-design practice across the system. Um, so this is also to recognize we wouldn't expect it, everyone and anyone to be able to, to be at the level of flourish. Before I go any further, I'll, I'll launch my final poll. Um, and so this is a chance for you just to think about where you're at before I explain anything else just have a go at saying either think about yourself as an individual um, or choose a team or organization that you're working within um, or with and like tell us how would you rate your overall level at the moment totally anonymous um, and we'll see we'll see where people are at here before we get a bit more nuanced And once again, if you cannot interact with the poll, you're very much welcome to write in the chat. Just one of these words, explore, understand, apply, integrate, or flourish. You see 81% of you have participated in the poll. I'll just give it another minute, maybe, if people are still trying to work out where to, where to place themselves. All right, I'm going to end that poll now um, and share these results with you. So we can see we've got a real mix um, on this on this uh, seminar today. Highest um, is that understand level, um, and I'm probably not surprised. That's probably why you're here. You're kind of interested. You've got a you've got some understanding about um, co-design. But actually, if we think about who's on the call, there's a lot of evaluators and researchers. So you're not necessarily doing or even expected to do co-design, um, but a lot of understanding out there. And quite a few, 30% um, of you are already applying co-design. So that's 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 awesome. 11% are integrating um, and we've got one person who identifies as flourishing. Awesome. Good for you. Um, and 24%, so a quarter of... Um, the people here are exploring. You're getting curious about co-design. 
So that's where, if I just share this with you, especially acknowledging if you're just getting curious about co-design, you're probably not even sure. Like, what do you know? What don't you know that you don't know? What, you know, where do you, how, where are you exactly? So let's break it down a little bit more. Um, and in a moment, I'm going to give you a link to actually do a little quiz and get a um, another way to think about it. I guess one thing I would just share before then. So today I'm just going to give you the high level quiz. But one of the things I'm interested in doing when I am actually going to be using this as a, a more fully fledged tool is able to kind of make recommendations for people. And one of the things I've already noticed is like the training that I offer currently is pitched at different levels of that. So, you know, I offer an introduction workshop to co-design and that's very much for people who are just beginning to explore and understand I've got another um, short course that I offer that assumes some prior knowledge. So it assumes that people showing up have some understanding. I'm not doing the real 101 version for them, um, but that they're in the very challenging position of trying to apply co-design um, in, in their work. And then I've got a quite a different program for people who already have that knowledge and understanding and are actually trying to take their, their co-design practice to the next level. Um, and so that's quite a different program where it's really designed around short training sessions and lots of people applying, reflecting, discussing with peers. Um, so I think, you know, that's obviously one way that I'm looking at using this tool, but I've heard from already some individuals and organizations that there's other ways that people might um, be able to use it. So that's something you can think about as we go. So we just did this poll of, um, and I'll stop sharing it too, of how you'd rate your overall or individual team level. And what I'm going to invite you to do now is to take a quiz um, and I'll explain each of these questions as we go through. So I'll also throw this link into the chat. Um, you can just copy it down or use the QR code to get a copy of the quiz or in the chat here um, you can find the link to do this. So what I'll do is I'll talk through each of those four key domains and you can assess your level as we go. So you can use the form. The form's particularly there so you've got a reference. Um, if you like you can submit it at the end um, and then see the overall results that people have done. But the first thing you need to do is decide whether you want to complete that quiz at an individual, team, or organizational level, and just be consistent for each of those um, with each of the questions. So the first level or um, area domain, as I'm calling them, is people. And when we're talking about people in design, design and co-design, we're thinking about relationships and participation in particular. So I'd like you to think about where you're at um, in terms of people. Are you just getting curious about what different people can bring to a co-design process? Do you already understand the value of incorporating different kinds of knowledge into our work? And there we're really talking about, in particular, the difference between lived experience and learned experience, or the difference between different kinds of, you know, specialist, technical, um, and living knowledge. Applying it is going beyond just thinking it's a good idea to invite people with lived experience into the work, but actually having dedicated resources and roles for co-design and forming co-design teams with people from different backgrounds. So that would be not just, you know, uh, a project team made up of people in the same kind of role at your organization. Integrating is going a bit further and having ethical and responsive practices that really take into account safety and reward the contributions of a di diverse range of people who would not only take part in co-design, but also a diverse range of people being able to lead co-design. Oops, sorry. And finally, flourish would be really unlikely at an individual level on your own. Um, you probably need to be part of a group or organization to be at the level of flourish here, to be investing and in building capacity and creating the conditions for participation. At that level, you model and advocate for culturally grounded, power sensitive and trauma responsive practices. So please use the quiz to pick what level you think you're at currently for people.
place is the next domain and I find um, this is often one I have to explain a little bit more because it's not one we're always um, explicitly asked to think about uh, but another way to think about it would be context and conditions so conditions here we're thinking in particular about organizational conditions for supporting innovation and participation so if you're at that explore level, you're beginning to see that context matters for co-design, um, that not all it's not all one size fits all. Understand would be you can actually identify the location and level at which you're working. So that order of design that I shared earlier, um, and you understand the importance of identifying location and level and the importance of having a supportive environment for innovation and participation. Apply is when you are able to choose a co-design approach that specifically will work in the context where you're based. Um, and you're actually realizing that, you know, as much as everyone is the expert in their own lives and people are creative, you do actually need to work to create conditions that support participation and innovation. And you're starting to do that work. Integrating is when you're getting to be able to adapt and iterate co-design processes, principles, and practices. So, you know, you're thinking about where you're working, how you're working, and you're not just taking something off the shelf and, and trying to fit it into where you're working, but you're able to adapt it. Um, and that you're embedding innovative and participative ways of working in your organization or network. Flourishing is... Um, where you'd explicitly challenge one-size-fits-all approaches and be able to critically reflect on your role within the system. You'd be sharing nuanced learnings about the conditions for co-design and building trust and capacity for innovation and participation across your system or sector, whatever it is that you, you would identify as being part of. So please choose where you're at in relation to place. Practice, our third domain, um, can also be thought about of core capabilities. So this is um, kind of most aligned with other capability frameworks where people are looking at the different kinds of skills and knowledge needed to do co-design work. So you're probably at the level of explore if you're new to design generally. Um, you're just kind of starting to learn about the methods, tools, and techniques. If you know what the difference between human-centered design and co-design practices um, and you're really interested in learning about creative and participatory ways to achieve shared goals then you're at that understand level you're applying it if you're actually using those methods um, and techniques to work with a diverse range of people and as part of that it's also you know recognizing that an important part of co-design is building mutual understanding and developing promising ideas to achieve shared goals um, so that's what you should be doing if you're applying um, co-design again integrate is about adapting um, and embedding so finding ways to bring co-design into your ways of working not only co-design projects you might be thinking about how to work in co-designerly ways with colleagues and communities for instance and flourish, you will be pushing practice forward at that level, developing approaches to co-design that integrate um, tools, techniques, methods from other fields, and also supporting or training others to build their capabilities in co-design. So where do you think you are in relation to practice? And finally, process. So there's a little bit of overlap between practice and process, but in process, we're thinking more, you know, while practice was about more about individual and team capabilities, process is thinking more about the broader, the broader structures of the work and thinking ab about planning and stewardship in particular. So at the first level, you're probably interested in following a design practice, a process, um, but you would be go a bit further to be familiar with the iterative phases of design if you're at the understand level um, and understand you'd be interested in how to be more flexible and adaptive so not too rigidly following a pre-existing process apply you've probably got your own approach to co-design it might be something that your organization or sector uses um, that is kind of fit for fit for context um, you'd also be thinking about 
navigating key moments with care and the key moments that I articulate in the um, systemic design practice framework are the moments of invitation when you're deciding whether or not to do the work, preparation when you're getting ready to invite and engage other people in the work, navigation, so key milestones or moments or inflection points throughout the project, and finally completion. So Thinking about completion, integra the integrate level talks about adapting your approach, involving responding to needs, planning for endings, and building capacity for implementation. That you would not begin or continue a co-design process unless the right conditions were in place. And finally, that level of flourish. Um, if you're there, you're modeling flexible and responsive processes for co-design that do result in beneficial outcomes. You're actually making a difference by following these processes and you're training and supporting others to, to follow these processes and navigate these key moments with care. Again, you're ready to finish and leave a project when it's appropriate and you'd probably help people to understand when co-design is not the right approach. So where are you at with process? Uh, and just once again, if you've um, dropped out and come back in, we are completing the quiz here that is at this link. Um, if you submit the quiz now, you, well, one thing I'd say is um, if you want your individual answers, just take a screenshot or note of them um, because it's totally anonymous. So they won't get sent to you or anything. Um, but you can see the overall results so far if you submit. Um, this is the second group who's completed it. The last group, interestingly, um, was a more design-focused um, audience that um, when I presented this to the CX Collective, who are a New Zealand-based design community. So you can see what results there are. I um, have a few, few minutes for questions, but I would also just like to um, invite you to um kind of copy or click on this link now um, for another survey and this is a chance for you to give me some feedback on the session and the quiz and sign up if you would like a copy of these slides I'll also be really happy to break down the results from today's session um, for individual team and organization type responses so if you um, want to put your details down I can share them with you um, or you can also sign up for other updates I'm also as I mentioned currently developing an individual um, assessment tool that is a much more fleshed out version of what we did today that has many questions for each of those domains um, and helps to kind of make some of the differentiation between an individual um, capability and organizational context and conditions. So I'm developing that tool and we'll be using it um, as an assessment for my um, co-design practitioners program and perhaps also offering it in future. But I'm really keen to get feedback, especially, um, you know, it's great that we've got so many people who are um, at different levels of maturity today and who work not necessarily in design. And so I'm quite interested in getting feedback on how this makes sense or resonates or not with you um, and welcome welcome any feedback you'd like to give me um, via that link that would be so appreciated uh the good news is because I've raced through this uh we've got I think about 10 minutes for questions if um anyone would like to so Mallory shall I hand over to you yes absolutely thanks Emma um I might just take off the spotlight there so I can see everybody's uh, screen. So I'm Mallory from FBC. I'm filling in for Matt Healy today. Um, I'm into this bit last minute, so it's been super interesting for me to sit and listen to that session. So thanks so much, Emma, for that. Uh, we've got one question in the chat, so I might put that to you and then just open it up to the floor if people want to use just use the uh, raise your hand function in the chat. Um, so the question from a little bit earlier in the presentation, and it's um, when the community become advocates and then professional advocates, would their input then be considered community-led? For me, it's very much about who holds the kind of power and resources. So if um, community advocates are able to advocate for what they want, that's great. Um, but if, I guess it depends what we're talking about. Like if we're talking about a program or project that they are actually leading, 
then absolutely. But if they're just advocating to an organization that is delivering something, um, then I wouldn't call that community led. I'm happy to like if someone wants, I think because it's a very much it depends kind of a, a response. I'm really happy if whoever wrote that question wants to um, elaborate and I can give a. a Hi, a, Emma. Sorry. Thank you. That was my question. Um, I I think what you said about um, who's holding the power is is really the, the key. Um, so, yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, the, the context is. Um, you know, the professional advocates in, in the health system, um, you know, as they do become very experienced, um, what we're hearing is that then they they kind of lose their sense of being the people with lived experience who are um, who are speaking as someone who doesn't necessarily have all the knowledge about the system. And so, yeah, that it's just a been at the top of my mind as an interesting dynamic and not quite sure how to integrate it into what I'm writing. Yeah, it is a really interesting tension at the moment, Lauren. Like one of the things that's really fantastic to see in the health sector in particular, mental health in particular, is respect for lived experience and the professionalization of it. But that is it comes with challenges because then those people start becoming part of the system if you're actually a professional. So I think one of the things if you are taking a co-design approach would be that you are not only working with professionals with lived experience, that you are engaging people who do not work in and for that system that you, you're part of um, or the organization that's involved. And you're engaging people who, you know, aren't burdened with the the knowledge of how to navigate the system but actually be, maybe better represent the the average or extreme um users or consumers uh and so i think it's it's great to have professionals ideally you, you can lead you know have people with lived experience leading that work so you, you've got peer workers um but i think it's really important not to you know to only engage professionals in the work yeah thank you great Thanks, Emma. Um, I'll just open it to the floor now if anyone has any other questions they'd like to jump in with. I have to jump out, but I just wanted to say thank you. I really enjoyed it. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Willie. <laughs> um, just maybe a question about how you found the kind of tools useful um, across the kind of different kinds of work that you do. Which tools would that be? Jethro? Oh, sorry, the, the maturity model, I mean, particular. Yeah, so I haven't used it much yet. So I've been developing it and kind of testing it in sessions like this. Um, the first applica like proper application of it for me is going to be um, for my main program that is for experienced co-design practitioners. One of the challenges I've had with that, I get lots of people who want to be part of that program. There's only 15 places and I have to decide who's at a level where they've got enough understanding um, to, to, to really make the most of it, but they're also working in a context where they can apply the learnings. Um, so I'm going to be using this tool firstly at an individual level um, to, be, to be helping me to understand where people are at um, and not in just a you need to be high enough, but like, you know, that you do have some challenges, you do want to learn, you, you do have area to grow as well. The next iteration I see possible, and you know, I'm keen for feedback on this because um, I've had feedback too, is at a more organizational level where you would actually be getting different different people in that organization giving their view and rating, you know, the organization um, to to come up with kind of a, a, a an integrated picture. I think though that's going to need to be quite context specific um, because different sectors and different countries will have different norms um, even you know testing this with some colleagues from um, the states they've commented on how differently we talk about decolonization here in Australia and New Zealand and like for me that's a really important part of the place domain um, but I think these things do depend on the context in which you're working um, so I yeah I mean you know, if anyone's interested, I, I I would be keen if there are is an organization that's keen to use this and sponsor the you know development of a, a tool for use in their context. I'm like open, I'm open to working with people next year on that. 
Thanks, Emma. Um, just had two more questions in the chat. One's about uh, co-design resources. Is there perhaps somewhere um, you could direct people to for that? And then the other one we've got is about overcoming barriers to doing co-design in complex systems. We've probably only got two minutes for that question. So <laughs> see if we can get a really high level view of what uh, your response might be there. Yeah, at the risk of being a bit self-promotional, um, I've got a co-design resource bank <laughs> that I've developed that is available to um, members of our community of practice. Jethro's, Jethro's a member too uh, of Co-Design Co. Design Co. Um, Willie, who just left, also was one. Um, so I found, I mean, I think one thing to say is doing co-design, you can use resources from lots of different places and disciplines and fields. So um, I don't think there's, you know, an exclusive one-stop shop um, but I have been a bit of a, a magpie collecting things from different places over the years and trying them out and um, borrowing them and taking recommendations from others and I've got a bit of a bit of a bulging resource bank um, that is where I now go I'm like oh have I saved that there um, I'd also probably yeah put a shout out Auckland co-design lab um, you know have some really great resources and things on their website as well and there's a bunch of others too um, the other question of yeah overcoming barriers it's pretty big because there's lots of different kinds of barriers um so maybe I don't know if we've got time if that person wants to ask their question aloud and I can um Hayley yeah okay. um yeah so I work in a government context but also doing my PhD research in um within the residential care space with children and young people and uh, encountering challenges to doing the co-design work because of ethical constraints and not being able to actually engage the children and young people who are currently using the system to do this work meaningfully and can only really draw on people who have lived experience through like um, lived experience groups who get paid. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just curious if you've had any success with doing this work with people who are current um, users of the system yeah totally it, it yeah it can be a challenge I think I mean sometimes it where it isn't possible the best thing you can do is to go through a proxy you know like someone who works with those people who can represent them and there have been times where I've been constrained and haven't been able to go through an ethical proper ethical process to to be able to do research with those people um and rather than just go oh well it's too hard go okay well you know and this was for instance um that supporting justice project early on where we were wanting to talk to people who had lived experience with the justice system and thinking about children and young people in that context as well um well we could at least talk to social workers or youth workers who worked with those people um mm -hmm. where there weren't as many ethical risks it's still not the same as involving those people and inviting people to speak directly for themselves and I think it's worth fighting for um one thing I guess would be to say too is like you don't have to try and engage lots and lots of people everyone but even if you can just engage a few people and those people being the ones who are in a safe place and are most confident and capable even if it's someone who can speak on their previous experience and maybe they're not right now so maybe they're like 25 years old um but recently were a child or young person in that system and can speak to that kind of recent experience again like trying to find sometimes creative workarounds if you can't directly speak to the people in that situation right now um but a lot of the time I think um one of the problems we face is people trying to do work in too much of a rush mm -hmm. and actually we should be going through a proper ethics process and taking the time to build relationships and develop trust and safety so that we can engage people um depending where you're at in an organization and in your experience you may have more or less influence on those processes um, but where possible i would encourage people to try and slow it down so that you do have the time um, to engage the people who need to be engaged and do it in a way where everybody is safe and comfortable thank you Good luck, by the way. It's tough work. <laughs> Thanks, Emma. Um, I've just shared a short survey in the chat from the AES um, and appreciate some feedback if anybody uh, can give a couple of minutes to that. Otherwise, I think we're probably ready to wrap up. So thanks so much, Emma. I'm sure everybody here got a lot out of that session. Um, and as you said at the end, I'm sure we're happy for people to reach out to you 
and get in touch, um, ask for the slides or and the recordings, obviously, um, going to be up for, on the special interest group pages. Uh, thanks, everybody, for your attendance today. And thanks again, Emma.